Good morning, Bayside. It's great to have you with us this morning. Let's stand together and worship and stand in our God's love this morning and have a good time in his name. Thanks for joining online and thanks for everybody in the cafe and outside. Amen. Here we go. Darkness tries to roll over my bones, but sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold. When brokenness and pain is all I know, oh, I won't be shaken. Come on, no, oh, I won't be shaken. Let's sing it out, church. In my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. All right. She no longer has a place to hide. Captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. Oh, I won't be shaken. Come on. No, I won't be shaken. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. And my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love and my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, I'm standing. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. This resurrection power that can save this power in your name, this power in your name, this power that can break off every chain, this power that can empty out a grave, this resurrection power. That there's power in your name There's power in your name My faith Come on. doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love and My faith doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love and My faith doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love Stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, I'm standing, I'm standing in your love. Oh, Standing on the rock, oh, I'm standing in your love. Let's give him a hand this morning for his love.
Spirit, Holy Spirit, coming in all of my strength. Who can make this Pastor Matt, our youth pastor here, I'm going to ask you to take a seat uh, as we continue this morning uh, in a time of celebration, uh, as we move towards a time of coming to the Lord's table and communion together. Uh, what a, a special opportunity we have, and, and we started doing this a couple weeks back as a church where every week uh, we're coming to the Lord's table to, to remember, uh, and this week it, as life was happening, and, and I'm sure all of you can attest, I just kept feeling overwhelmed by my circumstances. I just felt circumstance after circumstance going, God, how much can we take? How much can, can we, we hold? What can we do? And I felt the Lord clearly state, come to my table and remember. 
Remember that he is the Lord of circumstances. That circumstances aren't something that are out of Jesus' preview. But yet we get to come to a table and we get to remember somebody worth remembering. It's not that we come to the table and say, God, can you make me a better person? You know what? We get to follow Jesus and we're on that process. But what we get to remember this morning is that we serve a Lord who has victory. We serve a Lord who said, it is finished. And when we come to that table and we sit together, it's not a, a remembrance that we say, okay, I've got I've to repent because i got to hit a checklist. It's I repent, Jesus, because I forget that everything is in your hands. That everything is in your hands. So this morning, I know that there are many of you out there that are sitting there going, God, i got circumstances that are so far beyond what I can take. And Jesus says, no, remember. Remember, it is finished. And we get to sit in that holy space where Jesus says, you're one, you're with me. And we get to remember. So this morning, as a church, I'm not better than anybody else because I forgot to unwrap it before I got here. <laughs> we get to remember a moment that was singular, but a moment that had many more circumstances that were to come. Where Jesus gave us a sweet invitation. An invitation for all that would believe that all would have faith in who he is. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. Let's take of the bread. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it. For this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Let's take the cup. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are worth remembering. And as we gather here online this morning, help us to remember you are God and Lord over circumstances. You have victory. And as we sit at your table, it's you that we get to remember. The resurrected King. We're so thankful for what you've done and that we get to be a part, God, Lord, that we would get to be able to sit at your table, that you would sacrifice for us so that we could be one with you and the Father, God, and that you gave us the spirit that we'd be able to do it. As we continue in worship this morning, I just ask that that would be our heart. God, we have so much going on. There's so much going on. Everywhere you look, you, the world is out of control. The circumstances are great, but God, that you would give us a moment through your Holy Spirit that we would be able to look and we would say, you have victory. You have victory. You are worth remembering. You are worth giving praise. So Jesus, as we continue, that's our heart's cry. God, that we would be able to sing to you and remember that you are God and you are in charge. And we pray this in your name. Amen.
did wait upon your shoulder, my soul now to stand. So what can I say? What can I do?
participate in ministry with one another. I don't know if you get this, but let me kind of enlighten you to something, and some of this might blow your mind, but um, the Bible views all of us as ministers. What do you think about that? You don't, you don't have to have a title, the most holy reverend or whatever. We're all ministers. And when we surrender to what Jesus wants to do in us, we're also surrendering to what Jesus wants to do through us. And that's what's powerful. So last week, we really tapped a vein on something, and I want to kind of continue it. We had you just turn to somebody that you're with uh, or go to somebody and give them a word of encouragement. Now, what does that mean? It could be as simple as, man, I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. And uh, it, it doesn't need to be a treatise. It doesn't need to be the Magna Carta of some type of fancy language that you would use with someone. It's the simplicity of just saying, hey, listen, this is what I want you to know. And this is how I feel about you. My wife and I, this last week on our day off, we decided we would go to Pete's before we were going to go to do something and we were there and the lady that was working the counter I just felt really prompted I just said you know this lady looks like she's had a hard day but she's working really hard I went up and I said you know I really appreciate you I've watched you with three different people and you know how people are at coffee houses uh, you know it's usually very difficult no I didn't say that you missed one ingredient or something like this especially when you have 15 ingredients in that specialty drink right 
I want a macchiato caramel with this and blah, blah, blah. And by the time you're in it, I'm going, I don't know what they're drinking. <laughs> How about a plain coffee, huh? But uh, I went up to her and I just said, I just want you to know I really appreciate you. And I've been watching you. And she just goes, really? I go, yeah, I do. I've watched you. Oh, sir, thank you so much. Now, you may not know this, but that was ministry. We may not have called it ministry, but that was ministry. And what all I was giving her is what I felt prompted that I needed to give her in that moment. And you know what? It transforms marriages. It transforms relationships. It transforms friendships. So we're going to take a few moments, and I'm asking you, please treat this sacredly, meaning if you do it, it's from the heart, right? But we're going to give you a few moments just to turn to somebody or go to somebody and say, I want to just give you a word of encouragement. Go ahead. You too, sir. talking or hearing you speak and all that stuff and I know it's good <laughs> thank you buddy mm. all right bye bye How many of you think this encouragement thing's a good thing? Huh? I'm going to invite a few people on up, but while we're doing this, we're going to continue our worship with an offering. And, uh, and I'm, uh, can you, I'm going to invite three people up, uh, Angela Billings, Colleen Johnson, and Mark Saget. Could you welcome them? By the way, I want to thank uh, Mike Spade, Jeff Culver, and um, the men. We had to rearrange things because listen to this, folks. In the last five weeks, we, every week we are breaking attendance records. And so we're having to make room. And, uh, and so we got people all over the place. But we want to continue our worship with uh, receiving an offering. You know, there are the three ways you can give online, by mail, and in person few moments we're going to have our ushers come by thank you for your faithfulness thank you for uh everything that you're doing to um contribute to the mission of what bayside exists for can we pray jesus we thank you so much for your faithfulness we thank you for your grace and we just thank you lord that uh, for those who need work you're going to give them work for those who are struggling right now that you would encourage them to know that you are faithful in every which way Lord, um, the words cannot even uh, express our desire just to thank you for that. And for this, we just continue our worship by giving back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. While the ushers are receiving your offering, we want to take a few moments to tell you about a few things that are happening at Bayside. But there's a reason why I have these three people who are up here. As you well know, we have just transitioned in with a new association with Transformational Ministries. That has given us the opportunity, for instance, with Matt Moorcraft, who was our children's director a few months ago. We laid hands on him, and he is now our uh, ch uh, youth pastor, I should say. And, uh, and Matt is doing a fabulous job and is great at what he does. 
We have a few candidates here that are in the process of preparing themselves. Angela Billings, you probably have seen her team. They're our new connection team. And Angela's in the process of candidacy. Colleen Johnson, who oversees not just CR, our recovery ministries here at Bayside. Um, and so she's in the midst of that. And then Mark Saget, who's been a part of us for a long time, who has served through many different seasons as a chaplain, is going to be coming on board as a care pastor. Can you welcome the three of them in this? September 11th, we're going to have a big celebration, and Willie Nolte, who is the president of Transformation Ministries, will be with us. He'll be formally in, uh, inviting our church as part of the network family, um, as well as on that Sunday, as papers are getting done and all the things that they're having to do, hands will be laid on the three of these individuals. And uh, we like to call them Radshak, Meshach, and Appendicitis, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay. Guess who's appendicitis? <laughs> so anyways, they're going to help me with announcements today. Remember our text number. If you need prayer to reach out to our staff and pastors, we have a number that we respond to, and we try to be very faithful. We also have a connection card. If you look at the back of your your chair, you, if you fill out that connection card, we promise you that we will respond to that. Immediately after this service, Angela Billings and her turn team, if you're new to us, please, I will be there. I want to greet you. You get a chance to meet some of the leaders, to meet you right outside at the connection table, and we also have a special gift for you that we want to give to you. We're looking at the screen, and here we go. Today is family Fun Foam Day. We got a whole lot of foam. So here's what it happens. You don't have to participate in the foam to stick around. I will, by the way. But uh, we have lunch for you. So the lunch is going to be provided so you could stay and have lunch. We will make sure we keep the worship center and the cafe open because we know that it's hot outside. For some of you who can't take the heat, you can eat indoors. Uh, where it's air conditioned, uh, if that's what you choose to do. And we also have tables outside, but it's for the whole family. Come on out. It is going to be a lot of fun. All right, it's my turn. <laughs> Our Celebrate Recovery launched two weeks ago. It's going great. God is blessing every single week. So every Wednesday, 6.30 p.m., also, we're getting ready to launch our next round of step studies. I don't have a start date yet, but those will be on Monday night. If you're interested in either of those, um, email us at celebraterecovery at baysideplacerville.com or let us know on your connection card. And Thursday night last uh, week, the 18th, we kicked off uh, step, uh, not step study, <laughs> beg your pardon. <laughs> We said, don't worry, they won't know that you made a mistake. Sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, appendicitis is the one who made the mistake. So. <laughs> Thursday night, women's and men's Bible studies with children's programs. So come on out, study with us, bring your kids. They've got plenty of stuff for them to do. And uh, like I said, our kickoff was last week with a movie, uh, Case for Heaven. So hopefully we'll see you out there next Thursday. Next slide. No, that's the video. All right, so I was going to announce, so all you ladies out there, we have women's retreat coming up, and it's October 21st to 23rd, so we are like down to just a few places for folks to sleep. So if you're interested in coming on the women's retreat, please uh, sign up. You can do it on the uh, church app or see one of us, and we can help direct you. That's awesome. So, hey, listen, in a few moments, Jerry White, who's in Colorado visiting family right now, he is the chairman of our servant leadership team. Our servant leadership team is what would normally be called a board or a group of people who uh, oversee uh, many of the missional things that deal with our finances and a lot of things. They're just a great group of people. Uh, he has done a video that he's sharing with you about the next season of life in our church. So if you could be looking at the screens. And by the way, didn't they do a great job? Even appendicitis. 
Hey, good morning, Bayside family. This is Jerry White. I'm the chairman of the Children Leadership Team. And uh, I can't be in church this morning, but Al had asked me to send him a little video presentation uh, to explain a couple of things that uh, we're, we're going to be uh, moving to uh, and changes that we're making in the alignment of, uh, of the church. And so we're, we're going to be communicating more of that for the next couple of weeks uh, on some very specific aspects of what that means. And then uh, if you remember, we've been talking about September 11th. We have an all-congregation meeting right after church. And we'll really unpack a lot of what that uh, means to us and, and how, it, uh, how it impacts us individually, how it impacts the church, and how it impacts the mission that, we, uh, that we're on um, as a church. And uh, so, but I wanted to play in a little bit bigger picture of that for us as we introduce you guys in a, in a, in a deeper context to what it means. Uh, you'll be hearing more information today, this morning from Al, and one of the, one of the first impacts of that uh, specifically to our church and to individuals within that church. And I won't let the cat out of the bag on that because that'll come up next. But uh, we've, we're moving from an alignment and association with uh, covenant, uh, the Evangelical Covenant Movement into a group called Transformation Ministries. And the pro one of the primary reasons behind that is um, it's, it allows us to focus on the mission of the church, who we're called to, to be, the mission to ourselves uh, as the church body and to the community at, at large as well. And then also for us to have a greater sense of um, accountability to that purpose, uh, that we would stay on task, that we would understand that task, um, and that we would engage, you know, not just pastoral leadership, uh, not just us as the, uh, the servant leadership team, but also you, the, you the members of, as, as well. Uh, I think, you know, with the events that we've seen over the past several years, um, you know, the church needs to be wakened up to its purpose. And uh, while I applaud and I'm so excited for what um, Al and Betsy and the team have walked us through over the past several years, we really want to take the next step. And uh, so that's a lot of what this uh, transformation ministry alignment is, is a group of churches that work together to help us just stay focused on that and uh, to, to take good positive steps and also to help us uh, grow leaders and also... Um, to grow the congregation, right? So um, oftentimes we feel a calling into doing something, uh, but we're not really sure where to go, what's the next step to do, and how do we as, uh, as members of the church, but not clergy, how do, we, how do we get on task, right? How do we do the things of, of the kingdom? And so that's really what the next uh, season of our church life is going to be like. And I, I'm really excited for that to be a part of, to, to be a part of uh, Bayside going forward. So, uh, uh, just remember, September 11th is that congregational meeting. Um, Al, I'm going to turn it back to you, but I want to just make one more comment here, and that is uh, just, you know, my heart is is heavy um, because of the events that we had uh, just a few um, just a few weeks ago. And uh, I just want to reach out, first of all, and, you know, call out to, uh, to um, Jeremy and to... Uh, Jana and Sophie and the family and the team, uh, the Satterfields, just say, you know, guys, we're 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 with you. We're praying for you. Um, my heart's broken, and uh, you know, we're we've planned for months to to be working down this process with the church and the alignment changes, and uh, walking through right now, it's with a heavy heart, and so um, so I just I just want to. Uh, just point that out that uh, this is not a light thing that we're doing. This is something really important for the church, but it, it, it's not without a lot of pain that we're all going through. And I, I really encourage all of us to just continue to press into the, in, into uh, being in God's presence, you know, uh, seeking to walk daily and uh, to hear His voice, um, to really uh, let His presence be in our lives every day. So, all right, well, I'll let you go. Thanks very much. I can take it over. We've been in a series that we on heaven, and the title this week is "What's Next." And uh, Pastor Betsy last week talked about heaven's legacy, talking about the cloud of witnesses. And this week, I wanted to talk about um, living a legacy of faith. What does it mean to live a legacy of faith? And here's the question that I have for everybody that's in the room. Have you looked behind you to see who's living in the wake of your life? 
Here's the thing that we miss. There isn't a person in this room, in the cafe, online, in the patio, wherever you're at, that you live your life, and in the wake of your life, somebody's not following you. There is influence. Everyone has some type of influence in their life. Heaven is real, and understanding that those who go before us are part of the cloud of witnesses, we all live in the wake of other people's lives. But you see, heaven being real demands that I ask a simple question. How shall I live? How am I going to live? How do I live this thing out? Now, I'm going to give you a generational perspective to what I'm saying because there are three generations primarily that is listening to this message that they interpret things a little differently. First, if your age is 18 through 45, this is what most young family, young dads, young moms uh, constantly are asking. How can I maximize my moments? How can I maximize the moments in my life? It's during those times of uh, life that we're working, and usually you will have two, uh, uh, the man and the wife, uh, they're working. It's a busy life. How do we maximize the moments that we have with our kids? How do we do that well? How do I do it with my spouse? How do I maximize moments? And then ages 46 through 65, how can I maximize my influence? You come into that midlife stage of life and you're asking, how can I get my influence to be beyond me and live beyond me? And then ages 65 to 100, by the way, some people are living to 100 these days. huh? How can I maximize my legacy? How does this thing live far beyond me generationally? Before I jump into that, I have to qualify something because where I'm going to end may not be where you think uh, a person would end in this message, but I'm going to talk to those who are followers of Christ. If you identify as a follower to Jesus, there are four types of people who approach eternity. Let me give them to you. I really had a lot of fun with this, by the way, so the graphics kind of made me laugh. Con the first is consumer Christians. What is a consumer Christian? A consumer Christian are people who engage in church functions regularly with ever, without ever engaging what it means to be a, have discipleship to Jesus or be a follower to Jesus. And they have a sense that, you know what, there's always, I always have tomorrow to get it right. I just always got tomorrow. They always, you know, one of these days, Jesus, uh, I will surrender all, but just not today. Today I want to do life on my terms, and we'll get to that sometime. Sometime we'll get to that. And then there's the, the second one. I had a lot of fun with this one. I call them vampire Christians. <laughs> vampire Christians are people who just want a little bit of Jesus in order to make heaven, but they suck the life out of everyone while on earth. <laughs> Because it's all about them, and Jesus is like a sticky note in their rearview mirror. Huh? No one knows anybody like that, right? They just suck the life out of you. And then, because we had an in and out uh, restaurant here, I had to do this one. in and out Christians. in and out Christians are people who think of the church as a sort of drive through and they're banking that when they show up, you're going to give them something that will make them feel better. They expect a single cheeseburger, but occasionally their commitment goes from a two to a four because they got a double monster with spread. I'm hungry right now. That double monster would be good. For them... The drive through is as close to heaven as they'll ever get, not understanding that God has prepared a place for them beyond the drive through They're just kind of happy with the drive through but they don't understand that God's got something even beyond that for them. And then there's the passionate and optimistically broken Christians. The passionate and optimistically broken Christians are people who are not perfect, 
but they choose to lean into grace of Jesus Christ to allow their brokenness to be transformed into joy. They are passionate to invite people to the journey with Christ, understanding that this life, though it is a gift from God, is a practice for our real home. It's all practice. It's warm up. It's how we get to live towards our real home and our real destination. So let me give you the anchor passage for the series. By the way, whatever category you are will become the filter by what you hear this morning. And my hopes is, Holy Spirit, come and open hearts. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do to transform us and to take us on the journey of what it means to live with eternity in mind, that heaven is real. And here it is, Colossians 3, 1 through 3, since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, set your sights to the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. I love what Billy Graham said when he was talking about legacy. Look what he says. The greatest legacy one can pass on to one's children and grandchildren is not money or other material things accumulated in one's life, but rather a legacy of character and faith. I caught a glimpse yesterday. My grandson is playing his second year of tackle football, and he's in Rockland. And my son, because they didn't have enough coaches, they said, hey, they told my, asked my oldest boy, will you coach, which he's coached at the high school level with me. He's got plenty of experience, played college ball. And so um, I'm sitting on the sideline, and the whole time, my son, my, me with my youngest son, Aaron, are walking back and forth, and we're just talking strategy. Well, this is what they need to do. They need to go 53, take the linebacker out, take the safety down, and go right off that tackle because he's not moving, so blitz him. And so, uh, you know, we're just kind of, and this one dad looks at me and says, uh, I'm guessing that the two of you are father and son. Yeah. Well, you kind of look like each other. And the guy on the field, he's your son too. Yeah. And you're all coaches. Yeah. <laughs> How did you know that? He goes, well, I could just tell you're walking back and forth and you're talking all this stuff that I don't understand. I said, that's my grandson out there. So we're, we're just, you know, we get excited. But watching my son out there, he wouldn't know this, but he's third generation. Coach. He's third generation. My son, Aaron, just looks at me and he goes, you know, this is, we're Sotos. This is just what we do. This is just what we do. It's in our blood. There is something to the fact that we say that as a, as a follower of Jesus, most things aren't taught, they're caught. And it's the same things in life. And what Billy Graham is saying, a person of character and a person of faith, that gets caught down the line. You see, leaving a legacy does not begin with what we do, but instead, who we are. It's who I am. That's what gets caught. It's who we are. And in light of eternity, there's a verse that just jumped out at me in the Old Testament where the psalmist says, teach us to make the most of our time so that we may grow in wisdom. Now, in modern-day American culture, we may say, can I grow in material wealth? Can I grow in all kinds of other things? But the psalmist says, no, that I would grow in wisdom. And on our spiritual journey, here's the good news. The good news is that God begins to change us in such a way that what happens in us becomes contagious in the lives of others. Heaven is real, so how do we leave a legacy of faith in a way that we obey Christ in our today? How do we do that? Well, first, there are actions of the wise and actions of the fool, and it's always wise to obey. 
Look what it says in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. Anyone who listens to my teaching and obeys me is wise like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it is built on rock. But anyone who hears my teaching and ignores it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will fall with a mighty crash. In 1985, a gentleman by the name of Nick Alfano was a contractor at Barrington Avenue Foursquare Church where my wife and I were serving. Nick asked me because he knew I was kind of a starving college student. He said, hey, Al, I got a job in Malibu, and I'm the general contractor, not just the electrician. Can you come and check the job? Do you know that house in the Marvel movies, Iron Man's house, Tony Stark's house that's on the side of the hill? It's a real place, though they doctor it up. Take two miles down from that house. There's a other set of houses that are on cliffs. So we go to this guy's house, and what has to happen is they need to reinforce one part of the foundation of this house. But the guy is telling Nick, and I don't know anything of what they're talking about because I'm not a structural engineer. I don't get any of that stuff. They're debating back and forth what needs to take to place to anchor this house on the side of the hill. And Nick is going, I will not take the liability of this job if you don't, it's not about money and me put more money in my pocket. It's fa the fact that the way that you want to do it will not keep this house on the side of the hill. I don't know how many of you know, but that, that winter in L.A., they had torrential rain and storms. And Nick calls me and says, Al, look on the news. You remember the house that we looked at? I go, yeah, uh, it ain't where it used to be. The house was sliding down the cliff. And the reason being is, and it wasn't a told you so. Nick wasn't taking great joy that I, he told the guy. He said, this is, matter of fact, I can remember the conversation. Nick even told the guy how the house was going to slide down the hill. Because you know, this guy was brilliant. He did all these houses and engineered these homes. And, and, and here, sure enough, here's the house going down the hill. Why? Because he didn't listen to wisdom. Why is wisdom so key? Wisdom is key because God doesn't just speak kind of through, uh, I, even though he does, through impressions and those types of things. But most often, God speaks through people. How many of you husbands just, maybe it's been a revelation to you just in recent history, your, your wife can be used by God, and God shows her stuff. Huh? 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 I can't tell you how many times Valerie Soto says, we don't need to do that. That's not wise. And the times that I said, honey, I am the man of God. I see and I know and I want. And we do and it goes bad. This is the reason why some of you have heard the story. I bought cars we shouldn't have bought, and the tires flew off in the middle of the road. <laughs> and my wife doesn't tell me you, she, you told me so. She just, her prayer life has increased over time. <laughs> I've given her wonderful opportunities to pray. There are people in the church that are wise. We have elders. We have people who have lived a little bit of life that you might go and you seek counsel, and they go, you know what? There's a better way of doing that. And that kind of wisdom is key to helping us navigate the rocks of life. Man, I'm the man today that learned how to parent and father because wise men in the church said, Al, here's something that you need to be aware of. The scripture is filled with wisdom. A solid rock is a visual image of something that will last. And Jesus is not just saying, listen to my teaching. He's saying the fools are the ones that don't apply it and don't obey it. They don't live by it. And so what happens is we find ourselves constantly putting ourselves into the ditch 
because we don't want to listen to wisdom. Here's the second thing. Obedience to God's ways will produce fruitfulness. Obedience to God's ways will produce fruitfulness. Now, when we think of fruitfulness, we always think in our culture of the accumulation of things or stuff or money or whatever it is. But can I tell you that for the psalmist, he said all that stuff is vapor. He says... He's talking about the accumulation of wisdom that says, how do we live life doing things God's way? How do we live life with wisdom? A fruitfulness that says that, that the things that you find yourself sharing with Jesus gets translated. Look at it says in John 15, 4, remain in me, that's Jesus, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful apart from me. Whew. Wow. Grab that one. That's a powerful one. Remain in me. Now, for some of us, we might say, fruit, really? Come on, Al. Fruit, a return on my investment. But let me tell you something. It pays off. When later in life you see the fruitfulness of a life grow in the wisdom of other lives and those people around you. Uh, I've coached football for many, many years. So just the last recent years I've, I've, I've not done this. A young man who's an Asian young man, the only reason why I say that, he was the only Asian young man on our team in Lincoln. He came for one year. His dad was in the military. And I had, this man was a tremendous, this young man was a, a very awesome athlete. Uh, he really excelled. I said, let me pull you aside. And, he, and, and, and we would talk. He would always come up to me and say, Coach, give me the secret to success at being a great teammate. I said, character. Always be unselfish. Always be there for your players. If you do that, it translates in life, and you'll be successful. I'm on Facebook. And you know how you get these message requests? And, and I don't, I'm not really, you know, some of you younger folks who could just whiz-bang that stuff. You know, I, I try to send a fast text message, and then soon I'm apologizing because what I sent is not what I meant. And they're going, Pastor Al, certainly you're not calling me this name. Because <laughs> I have fat fingers, and then it transposes everything and predicts what you want to say. Not good. <laughs> not good. So I'm looking at Messenger, and I get this request, and it's this young man. And so I, I get on the request. He says, Coach Soto, it's been a long time since uh, you were my coach, but I wanted to tell you it paid off. I chose not to go play college football, but I became a Navy SEAL. And I'm serving with the SEALs, and I want you to know your words never, ever do I forget. He walked away from a D1 school saying, I'm not going to play college football. I'm going to serve my country and become a Navy SEAL. Fruitfulness of life. Abiding in Jesus. The more I marinate, and can I be honest with you as a parent, I can't tell you the times I used to sit and go before Jesus and say, God, I don't even know what to do in this situation. I need your wisdom. And God would somehow give wisdom. Abiding in Jesus. Marinating with Jesus. I love what Matthew 7.20 says. Yes, the way to identify a tree or a person is by the kind of fruit that is produced. What kind of fruit is produced in a person's life is a pretty good indicator of what kind of root has taken place in their life. Thirdly, Obedience and fruitfulness will leave a legacy of faith. Jesus said, I appoint you to produce fruit that will last. That will last. Philippians 1, 21 through 22 says, For me, Paul, living is for Christ and dying is even better. Yet if I live, that means fruitful service for Christ. Now listen, that doesn't mean just for pastors. It doesn't mean just for missionaries. It means for fathers, mothers, uncles, 
aunts, and friends. As we pursue Jesus, Jesus begins to allow the fragrance of his life to be met, and people can smell that fragrance in our lives. It's something that becomes contagious. Here's, here's the, the, just the simplicity of it. Obedience equals fruitfulness, which equals legacy. Now, there are some of you who are going, I'm too young to be thinking about legacy. And I'm thinking, you need to be thinking about legacy in your today. Not only people who are really super old think about that kind of stuff. Don't cross the line. <laughs> legacy is something in your today. I won't get into all the details of it. My grandson's with us this weekend. God, I love him. He calls me Papa. Every time he calls me Papa, my, my, my heart melts. I'm not here to parent him like his parents. I tell my son all the time, he's going to get spoiled. He's going to get anything he wants. <laughs> Papa, I want a hamburger. Let's go. <laughs> my boys always go, you never did that with us because you're my kids. <laughs> this is my grandson. <laughs> Papa, I love talking to you. Just I love talking to you. Tell me why. Because you're the apple of my eye. When Jesus invites us to abide with him, even though there's millions and billions of people all over the globe, that's what Jesus says about us. You're the apple of my eye. If you would just spend time with me and hear my voice, oh, do I have some things I want to reveal to you? Oh, there's some things on my heart that I want to share with you. That's the Jesus we serve. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a few moments. If you have a pen, take the pen out. And here's what I'm going to ask. A faithful God who leads us to abide with him. Here's the big picture. Do you believe you are capable of leaving a legacy? Because there's some of us who come from broken homes. Maybe we didn't have fathers and mothers. There's some of us who've had shattered things of addiction and brokenness and all kinds of things in our histories. And you're sitting here today and going, I didn't have that kind of pedigree. But it isn't about pedigree. It's about a person. And his name is Jesus, and he says to abide in us. And here's what I'm going to ask that you do. A young lady is going to come, Jacqueline, who's going to play the guitar, and she's going to sing. And while she's doing that, I'm going to ask that you reflect, what type of legacy will I leave? Are the things that I'm spending my time on legacy worthy? And when will I get serious about my own legacy? Can you welcome Jacqueline? And she's going to come, and I'm going to ask that you just...
How do I turn someday into today? I've given you a few action steps. Grasp your significance. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Today's obedience is the foundation for tomorrow's breakthrough. Act intentionally based on God's wisdom and not preferences. Build relationships in a healthy spiritual community. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing that we know, you can't do it alone. you got to do it in a healthy community, in a community of people. And here at Bayside, we're, we're coming from a community to what does it mean to be a family? What does it mean to be a healthy family, God's family? How do we live out God's family with each other? Maximize your moments. Maximize your moments. Oh, man, I wish... I would have learned this as a younger man when I was, had a young family. I was, I was just so pressed on the focus of getting bills paid and the next thing and the next thing. 
Pause. Maximize your moments. They're precious. And honor others through being a servant. You can't go wrong. I love what Deuteronomy says. So remember this and keep it firmly in mind. The Lord is God both in heaven and on earth. And there is no other God. There is no other God. I love what Lamentations, we just heard the song. It was a wonderful rendition of it. Great is his faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every day. We do not need to fear the future for us who follow Christ because of the faithfulness of God. Fear is the derailer of living by faith. It also distracts us from loving others well. It robs us of our ability to be emotionally present. Because when fear is there, fear draws all the emotion out of you. For those who are in denial, if you continue to be frustrated by the same things that consume you emotionally, relationally, and spiritually, because heaven is real, you are created for a purpose it's time to do what you need to do to change. If you're a repeat offender, if these things keep on showing up in your life and you keep on going, it must be their fault. If the common denominator, write this down, is you, then it's you that needs to change. So what's next? To live like heaven is real and to leave a legacy. And here's the invitation that Jesus gives to us. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. A second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend on the law and the prophets. I love what Bill Moorcraft said during our teaching team meeting. This was so profound. He says, your flawed plan will work if you live out these verses. If we simply just live out these verses, it will work. To accept the invitation of Christ to love God completely, to accept the invitation of Christ to love others. Dallas Willard, he says this, disciples are those who have been so ravished with Christ that others want to be like them. Oh, to be so full of grace and the love of what Jesus has embodied us to, to, that the others would say, oh, I want to be like that individual. And by the way, by the way, the best way to handle a mistake is to respond with humility. Amen. Respond with humility. <clears throat> Furthermore, our call is to obedience. You're going to see the picture as we close this morning of a, a couple that's very dear to me. This is Dr. Jack Hamilton. What you're seeing on the screen were the last words he spoke to me before he graduated to be with Jesus. But you got to know the back story. So, February 27th, 1984 was the last time I drank. And what led me to that point was a friend of mine tried to give me wisdom. I chose not to. I got myself in a situation. I'm in the Santa Clara drunk tank, and I said, I'm not going to do this anymore. I called this guy, and it began my jury, journey into healing. That year later, as I'm walking out sobriety and trying to obey Jesus in areas of my life, I forgot that visiting my parents in Southern California, I had put a card into this school called Life Bible College because I'd already had two and a half years at Bethany uh, uh, University in Santa Cruz, and I just put the card in. My grandmother goes, there's a guy on the phone from this life school, and he says, we have married student housing for you, and uh, school is ready if you want to come and matriculate into the fall semester. I quit my job at Hewlett Packard, Packed up everything and moved to Southern California. I finished my junior year. Things were going okay. Senior year, some difficulties were popping up. 
And I got a job on the maintenance crews. I got two jobs. My one job was, actually three, I was helping serve the church. I was doing maintenance for a missions agency in Hollywood. And then I got hired on by the school to be part of the, the maintenance team at the school. I, here's my official title. You're going to love this. I was the floor technician. My job was I stripped and waxed all the floors in the school and had to buff them out. Well, Dr. Hamilton loved shiny floors in his office, and to do his floors, I had to buff them at night so there wasn't any student traffic. So I'm there just buffing the floor out. It's about, I don't know, 9 o'clock at night, and I'm buffing these floors, and the light's on in his office. The door flashes open, and Dr. Hamilton goes, says, Al Soto! Yes, sir. Come into my office. I go into his office. Sit down. I've been watching you. What do you feel God wants you to do? Well, I thought about being a pastor, but, you know, I don't know. That's for me. I think I'm going to go into academics, you know. I think that's what I want to do. Son, that's what he called me. You're going to listen to me, right? Yeah, I'll listen to you, Dr. Hamilton. Called to be a pastor. Do you got that? I'm not worthy to be a pastor, Dr. Hamilton. <laughs> I'm here by the skin of my teeth. Look me in the eyes. You're going to be a pastor. And that man ministered to me for 30 minutes at 9:30 at night in his office. But what happened next blew my mind. I get three phone calls. It's the president of the denomination, the national guy who oversees all the churches, and one of the district supervisors. Every one of them said, Dr. Hamilton said, we need to speak to you about being a pastor. His son calls me. We're good friends. Al, he wants to talk to you. Is this you, Al? It is. Dr. Hamilton, continue to be faithful and keep making disciples. Be a spiritual father that believes the best in your spiritual sons and daughters and teach them to love God and love people. And he's now a part of the cloud of witnesses. I'm in the wake of his life. And I'm going to tell you something. Dr. Hamilton, I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. All of us live in the wake of somebody's life, and somebody is living in the wake of our lives. And when heaven is real, it's about a faithful God who calls us to faith and calls us to obey him. It's that simple. It's not rocket science. Every day I have to lean into the grace of God just like you do. Huh? Every day. Jesus, today I need to do this really, really well. Jesus, this is where I'm at today. I need you. And he's always faithful. You want to live with, as heaven is real? Live contagiously. In obeying Jesus. You can't go wrong. You can't go wrong. There's no shortcuts. There's no microwaving. It's oven baked. <laughs> it's oven baked. And when it's oven baked in your life, people then get around you. And they go, we don't know what's different. But we smell something different from your life. We see something different from your life. What is it? Well, it isn't my charming personality. It's Jesus. It's Jesus in me. And what you're probably smelling is early this morning I spent some time with him. And I said, God, I can't do this on my own. I need you. And when you spend enough mornings like that, you don't want to miss a morning. You don't want to miss a moment. You want to live life. Abiding in him. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God. 
Thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, that we, we can only do what you have done for us. And I'm going to ask this question. I'm not going to ask you to do anything else, but i got to ask this question. That if you're here today and you haven't fully surrendered to Jesus, if you haven't come to the place of your life where you said, Jesus, I'm giving you control of my life. I'm giving you and I'm surrendering this to you. I want you to know that you died on the cross for my sin and I can't fix myself. If that's you this morning, I'm just going to ask real simply, if you just look at me and just say, Pastor Al, that's me. I've never made that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. There might be several of you that are out there on the patio or in the cafe that are looking at me and saying, yeah, I've made that decision. Thank you. I'm going to pray a prayer in the few moments, but I'm going to talk to believers who you've already made that commitment, and maybe you're saying, you know what, Al? Man, i got to abide with him. It's time for me to obey Jesus i got to begin my, my journey of obedience on this journey. And if that's you, could you just say, hey, Al, I'm looking at you now, but that's me. I'm making that decision this morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eyes all over. So this first prayer I'm going to pray, and if those people who looked me in the eyes who have never made that commitment to Jesus, whether you're at the patio online, in the cafe, just follow under your breath with this prayer. Jesus. I just here and now ask that you forgive me of my sin. I ask Jesus that, that you come into my life. I fully surrender to you. I can't do life on my own. I can't do it independently from you. I'm choosing to follow you this day. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me of my sin. Lord, I desire to do life in obedience with what you want me to do life, not on my terms. I pray this now in your name. In Jesus' name. And for those who looked at me, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, it's that simple. Now, for believers, let me pray this prayer. And you can follow along. Jesus, I have been following you. And I've been at times wanting to do my own thing. And maybe not obey you fully. But I'm here and now saying with humility, God, I want you to take full reign of my life. I want to be a follower of you that obeys you that seeks out healthy community because I understand I can't do life on my own, on my own terms. That I need people in my life to, to give me wisdom and to stand with me and to be on this journey as a mother, as a father, as an uncle, as an aunt. And that, Lord, we could do this together, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, real quickly, we're going to change up the rules a little bit. Five of you looked me in the eyes and you said, I'm praying that prayer for the first time. Here's what I'm going to ask that you do. Here's where hospitality begins. If you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask that you to turn to, to the person to the right or left of you and said, I prayed that first prayer to receive Jesus. And I'm going to ask that person to walk up with you at the end of this service when Brian finishes it so they can be with you. And we're going to have people up here who are going to get you started on that journey. And if you're that second group of people, it applies to you too. Hey, you know, I just prayed that prayer to fully obey. Would you go up with me? Because I, I, I need prayer this morning so that I can fully obey Jesus. Can we do that? Because oftentimes what we'll do is we'll go, oh, man, you know, I don't want anybody looking at me. And but guess what? Can I clue you into something? We're all a mess. And we're all in need of Jesus. So it isn't all about you. There are others that might, you might be a four on your mess scale, and I can tell you what, I'm a six. So I got you licked. But we're going to ask that you turn to the person and you just say, can you walk up with me so that I can receive prayer this morning? Is that good? God bless you, Bayside. Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. This power that can break off every chain. This power that can empty out of the gate This 
Those words. God bless.